you are driven by expectation. If you're expecting recession, what are you going to do? You're going to batten the hatches down. You're going to look at reducing people's time and, and where can I cut my marketing? You're going to do all those types of things. So your actions and your behaviors flow <laughs> from your expectation. Love and attention are the same thing. I think that people don't realize that attention, kids will do anything for attention, right? Because attention and love are the same thing. They'll do anything for love. Future authoring. What would your life be like three to five years down the road if you could be anything the best person you could be for yourself? Yeah. And then you write for 15 minutes with no editing, just dreaming, just dreaming who that might be. And then another vision of who would you be if all the bad habits in your life had control? Who would you be in five years so that you have something to to run away from and something to, to run towards? And the Dutch women had the highest grades and the immigrant men had the lowest grades and after they did the future authoring program and the men the immigrant men in the next year were doing as well as the dutch women because they had to find their own motivation to be there good afternoon it is good Kevin. yeah it is good afternoon i suppose for you it's good morning <laughs> yeah it is. It's good morning. Mm. Not too early, though. It's 10, 10, 15. It's not too early. 3.15 for us. So welcome to my podcast, 3.15. Welcome for uh, coming on my podcast. Thank you for agreeing to speak with me. It's my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Um, today we're going to, we're going to talk, we're going to talk to you about uh, your, your journey through with your business. Mm. And uh, I'd like you to, to start wherever you'd like to start to oh, okay. uh, yeah. inform my, 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 my listeners just exactly how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, um, I've sold my business now. I sold it uh, four years ago uh, for a, a really good amount, which I'm very pleased, but I never intended to sell my business or build a business that that generated wealth um where shall i start i'll i'll start with my mum and dad if you don't mind my dad was a, mm -hmm. a a military policeman in the ref and uh sadly he when he retired from that from ill ill health he worked for local government as a trading standards inspector and basically what that is in the uk it's a, it's a government body that look into rogue trades. Uh, when I say rogue trade, I think you call them professionals, don't you? Builders, mm. plumbers, and electricians. And he used to tell me all these stories about okay. people being ripped off. So my my upbringing was, was quite strict. My dad was a military policeman. Um, and all my brothers and sisters, they're, they're quite a bit older than I am. Uh, and they all left home uh, a long time before I did. So, uh, it's, yeah, so it's quite, I'd, I'd say, a reasonably strict and good upbringing. But um, my dad wasn't a wealthy guy, and my mum was a seamstress, used to make wedding dresses. So uh, I, I came from quite quite a humble, humble background. And I basically, I bounced along the bottom of life for a long, long time. Um, but then something... Why is that? I, why? That's a really good question. I think it's because of the environment you grow up in and the people you associate yourself with have a big influence on your mindsets. And if you don't think you can achieve much, mm -hmm. I think that's basically where you stay. Anyway, I can talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that in the story. But basically, in 1998, so we're going back quite a few years, uh, I, I lived in a sleepy uh, seaside fishing village right down on the south coast of the UK. If you were to draw a line down from London, it's a little bit over to the left, but it's you know, people might get an idea from that. And it, 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 it was a peninsula, and it was one road in and one road out. Uh, only about 4,000 homes in this village. Anyway, a tornado went through 
this uh, this village of mine, which mm. in the UK is really, really rare. It doesn't happen very often, tornadoes. And mm. because of that, it caused about £10 million worth of damage to local uh, businesses and to homes. And uh, mm. that managed to get on the national mm. news. So it was on the BBC and ITV, um, and there was photographs uh, and video footage of houses being ripped apart and things like that. Um, and because of that, uh, all of a sudden, within almost 24 hours, white vans were turning up in Selsey, tradesmen. And a lot of these, a lot of these were not local. Their accent was from different parts of the UK. And over a period of time, what turned out to happen was is that people that were victims of the weather were now being victims of these really bad uh, cowboy trades or as you call them uh, professionals so people were paying extortionate amounts of money to have just tiles put put back on their roof um, one of the standard stories that was going around was that a tradesman would knock on your door because they he could see there was a hole in your roof and he would say, I'll help you. I'll put a tarpaulin over the roof to stop the rain coming in. So they would do that. And then they would spin them the line that the local merchants will only take cash. And there's about a thousand pounds worth of materials. So they were parting with all this money never to be seen again. Uh, basically for a tarpaulin, mm -hmm. they were paying a thousand pounds. And over a period of months after this event, Hearing all of these stories, I, I, I couldn't understand one thing. Um, I was about 34, 35 at the time, but I, I couldn't understand that if I went to my local store and walked out with a bottle of wine that I hadn't paid it paid for, I'd get arrested and I'd probably go to court. And yet, here's a professional, a tradesman, um, that can go into someone's house, take their money, and then go and do it to their neighbor and take their money, go and do it to another neighbor and take their money and get away with it. I couldn't understand. So it, it wasn't a light bulb mm -hmm. moment, but um, over a period of months, what I did was I looked at the, the guilds and the federations in the UK. Uh, I looked at local government, I looked at central government, and I tried to see whether there was an answer to the problem, which is where does a homeowner go to get a great professional? And I couldn't find an answer. So mm -hmm. um, I thought I'll give it a go. Maybe um, I can bring a solution to this. And one of the things that I've, I now understand um, after 24 years of doing this, I've now understood in business that the bigger the problem you can solve for people, uh, the more money and the more success you'll have. If you're looking at solving small problems, you'll not. Right. Yeah. And this was a big problem in the UK, huge problem. So, uh, so basically, I, I, I was very introvert at that point. I was very shy. Um, I hid behind my mum till I was 18. But um, I, uh, I basically picked up the phone and I found a tradesman that I knew. And I'll never forget his name because his ne he was the first guy on board. His name was Bill Lander and he was a fencing contractor. Anyway, I phoned him up and I said, Bill, I've got this idea. He says, go on, Kev, what is it? I said, uh, I've, I want to try and bring some accountability uh, and better choice to homeowners when they're trying to find a roofer, a plumber, an electrician, etc." He says, OK, go on then. And I says, look, if you can show me your qualifications... And because this was pre-internet, if you can show me letters from happy customers um, and your insurance documents, what I'll do is I'll, I'll compile all of these together. And at the time I was a carpet cleaner. I'll compile all of these, these trades together and, I'll, and I'll, I'll do a printed product. I might have two plumbers, two electricians, two roofers, two carpet cleaners, and, and, I'll, and I'll deliver it locally. Is that something you might be interested in? And he said, yeah, I would. So I thought, oh, wow, someone said yes. So uh, 
over the next month, <laughs> I, I got through all my friends <laughs> and people I knew, and now I'm cold calling. And that was so, so difficult. Uh, picking up that phone to a stranger and not being a mm-hmm. Explain cold calling because that's something all all people who sell need to know that cold calling is part of what you have to deal with. Or even if you're changing jobs and trying to find a job, cold calling. Yeah. Tell people what that's like well, because that's that's a brutal. It is brutal undertaking. It is brutal because. We've all got various issues in our lives growing up, for sure. Uh, And I know that one of the issues in my life is because I had uh, siblings that were so much older than me. I've got got two brothers and a sister, nine, 10, and 12 years older. Um, I felt quite rejected by my siblings. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had a lot of feeling of rejection in my life. My dad was very rarely around because of his, his job. So it was basically just my mum and I growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if you suffer from any form of rejection and you're really putting yourself on the line now, calling someone you don't know about an idea you have, and the chances are they're going to reject you. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was really, mm-hmm. really tough. Um, And I did, the usual, and I'm sure most entrepreneurs will have gone through this at some point in their lives where people are just saying, no, no, no. When you get it off the ground, come and see me. And it's like, how can I get it off the ground? If you Often they say, often they say there's 50 calls. You have 50 calls before you get a yes. I think that's probably right. So cold calls take... I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's your experience. So that's. Yeah. (laughs) I I think when you don't have a brand or a product that anybody knows, it's it's going to take that amount. But once the word starts to get out and your brand starts to get established, it becomes a little easier. But it was it 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 was incredibly Mm -hmm. tough. You know, um, I'm I'm married with uh, four children at the time. And, uh, uh, and I've got this printed product that I'm going to go to the print with. And I know that I have to sell 21 slots just to pay for the print and the distribution. If I don't hit 21, I'm losing money. And at that particular point in my life, I was cleaning carpets. I was selling, um, sorry, I was working behind a bar, uh, selling pints. <laughs> um, what else was I doing? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a I had a window cleaning round, um, so yeah, and and I was doing a little bit of artwork as well because that basically is my is my background. I was I was what's called a finished artist back then. Today they'd be called graphic designers, um, and having the skills in graphic design okay, yeah. helped me immensely in pulling this all together. But um, you know, so if I had only 19 boxes sold and I've got to get to 21, I've got to sell another another two just to break even. Uh, uh, and then once I've sold 21, it was like, oh, I'm going to make some money. <laughs> if I can just sell one more box, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd have made mm-hmm. over 200 quid. If I sell another six boxes, I've made over a grand, you know, and, and money was incredibly tight, incredibly tight. But um, anyway, I managed to get the first one done. For how long? For how long was the money tight? Oh, long. How long did the money not come in for? Oh, years, years, and that's all. That's all part. That's all part of the story. Oh, that's all part of the story, Tammy. But bas- basically, I, I was just mm-hmm. keeping my head above water, and uh, at the time, I was doing a little mm-hmm. bit of freelance work for a marketing consultant in London. And uh, we spoke earlier about environments and how they can affect you growing up. Uh, Mm -hmm. This guy lived in a completely different environment to me. He had a huge house in London with about seven acres and and inside an area that's classed of London to have that amount of land is just unbelievable. And I was doing a little bit of work for him and I showed him my idea. And he said, Kev, that looks that looks awesome. Can I be involved? And I was sort of like starstruck. Here's this little old me and, and here's this great big guy in, in, in the marketing arena that was doing work for Reuters of all companies. Um, so I said, oh, would you? And um, 
And I gave him, I think, 40% of the company, just gave it to him. Anyway, it became pretty obvious early on that, <laughs> that his talents, and he had a lot of talents, were not really at the right, the company wasn't at the right stage for him. And he said, look, do you mind if my wife takes my shares and my wife works with you? And uh, she, she was a phenomenal lady. Um, and, I, and I loved her to pieces. Mm. And she was so talented on the phone and I learned so much from her. Um, but we made lots of mistakes. I made lots of mistakes because I'd never been in business before. I got in trouble with the inland mm -hmm. revenue. Um, I didn't realize that I had to pay tax. That's how naive I was. Um, I got in trouble with Her, Her, Her Majesty's Customs for, for VAT. Um, I didn't understand how that worked properly. And uh, we took some... What's VAT? I don't know what VAT oh, is. It's value added tax. So if you buy... Okay. You buy yeah. anything, so like, um, yeah. You buy anything in the UK, the government will put 20% on. Yeah, I'm sure you have it where you are. <laughs> Um, we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, and we took a few people on to, to help grow the company. Uh, but sadly, we had to let them all go because I just we just got into such a financial mess. Anyway, we worked hard and we managed mm -hmm. to get ourselves out of that financial mess. Um, but at that point, I had an idea. And the idea was, is that we, we're seeing all these tradesmen and we're asking them for letters that they would have received from happy customers. And I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could get a continuous roll of recommendations from trades from their ongoing customers? And I thought, well, maybe I could do that through the internet. So what do you do when you've got an idea like that? You go, you go to the internet. I don't think Google existed at that point. Uh, it was out of Vista and a couple of others. And um, so I, I tried to find something I could copy. Basically, I was asking for online reviews. And I, there wasn't another company doing it in the world. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a claim to fame, mm -hmm. I'm the first in the world to do online reviews. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't because I thought I was fantastically oh. bright or anything. It, it just seemed like a good idea to me. And there was no one to copy. So I started to do it myself. And um, before that got started, I went to uh, this couple in, in London and I said, look, this is the, the direction I want to take the company. I want to do online reviews. And I can remember the gentleman saying to me, Kev, no one will ever want to be monitored. No one will ever want their customers to put reviews uh, on your site. And, and I don't do it, but I knew that was the way forward. I knew it. And, and sadly, the relationship uh, broke down. And uh, I said, well, look, that's the direction I want to take it, you know, and uh, it, it became quite tense. So um, I didn't really know what to do. So I went to see uh, a, a, a gentleman who was a pastor of a local church I'd known him for some years. I worked for him for some time. Uh, I wasn't working for him at that point. And I went, I went to see him. His name was John Tyler. Very wise, very wise man. Um, and basically, I, I explained the situation to him. And he said to me, Kev, you need to give them your business and start again. It's like, what? <laughs> I've been working on this for th three years? I haven't taken any money out of the business. We're just starting to get a little bit of traction. But I knew he was right. He said to me, you haven't yoked yourself equally. Not saying they're, they're bad people, but, but the way you are, Kev, compared to where these people are, you're just not equally yoked. And you're always going to be fighting. There's always going to be an element of, of, of upset. My advice to you is give them the business and start again. So I did. He was right. I gave him the business and they were quite upset about it. But I said, look, you, you, take, you take this business that, that we've already established in the direction you want to take it. 
and I will I will go ahead with my monitoring business. Um, and I, I formed a new company and I called it Check A Trade. Um, and uh, I didn't want any money for the business. I just gave it to them. And it was there was quite a lot of work, quite a lot of customers involved. And I started again. And um, and that was that was a good move for me. Um, the monitoring side of things was really tough because I'm phoning tradesmen up and I'm saying, I'm going to monitor you. And they're going, who are you to monitor me? Who are you? Because it was completely new. No one else was doing it. And I, I said, Look, this is the way forward, because if you can, if, if the customer can see what all your previous customers have said, surely that's going to give you an advantage over other trades. Surely. And, and some started to believe it. Some gave me a go. Um, and it, it really did start to, to start growing. And uh, I'm now employing a few more people. Um, uh, I'm getting people approach me saying, can I invest in your company? And uh, my eldest brother at the time said to me, Kev, don't do it. Don't do it. Because he had 10 years more experience in business than I had. He said, Kev, if you want some money, get, get the company valued and I'll, and I'll give you a bit of money. So that's what we did. So my brother, for a, a, a very small amount of money, he ended up with 25% of the company. Um, and I was hopeful that he would uh, be my mentor, but sadly that, that didn't happen. Uh, he was too busy building his own company and running his own life. But uh, things, things, things started to improve. Um, and it's now probably about year seven from the initial phone call that I make to, to Mr. Lander. And um, I'm still struggling. I'm still not taking a wage from the company. And I'm now paying people and not taking money out of it myself. I'm still cleaning carpets and working behind bars, mm -hmm. doing whatever I had to to feed, to feed my family. Mm -hmm. And um, something happened. And it was a friend of mine in, from church. Um, his name's Kevin as well. Uh, but we call him he, we call him little Kev. Um, it's quite funny because I'm about six foot three, and he's about five foot. <laughs> oh, okay. But um, really, really good friend of mine still is. We go fishing together a lot. Um, not enough though. I must do more fishing. Um, but he said, Kev, can I speak into your life? And I I said, Yeah, of course you can. Thinking, what's he going to say? Where's this going? Anyway, he uh, he said to me. And I can't remember the exact words, but they were this sentiment. He said, Kev, you're miserable. Your wife's miserable. Your children haven't had a holiday ever. You're flogging a dead horse. Give it up and get a, get a proper job. And that was like, wow. Um, yeah, that was a real kick. A real kick and I was still bouncing along the bottom of life you know most people have heard this but at the time if you'd have seen my business card it, it, it would have said this is Kev he works hard but has got no real ambition he's got a great idea but doesn't know how to take it forward and he's worth about 20 grand a year that would have been my business card um, that coincided with some CDs that uh, a very good friend of mine gave me. He said, Kev, I'm, I'm not going to listen to these. If you want to listen to them, you can. If not, throw them away. And it was from an American guy, an American Christian. His name was Bob Harrison. And he's called uh, Mr. Increase in America. And he does conventions in Hawaii and things uh, for entrepreneurs, but all, all on a Christian background. And these set of CDs were were called Awakening the Great Multitude Mind. What a, what a, what a, a mouthful for someone that's not educated. Um, anyway, I, I whacked one of the CDs into my car and I listened to the first one. And he, he explained how he had things that were pulling him forward in life and things that were pushing him back. And he called them magnets. Um, and he, he, he said in him, he believed he had some 
talent. He believed he had something to offer. But as a Christian, he felt that he should be meek, mild and humble and bounce along the bottom of life and give all his money to the poor. He certainly shouldn't be wealthy. He certainly shouldn't have influence or power or a big house. And I thought, you know what, that's exactly where I am. I I think from the environment that I've grown up with, from the environment that I've been in church, and I gave my life to the Lord when I was 22, the environment, that the church environment I grew up in was poverty. It was poverty. And I had it in my head that it is wrong to be rich. It is wrong to be successful and have influence and power. And the rest of these five CDs spoke about, basically, it it, it was a journey on what the Bible really says about money and that our God is a God of more than enough. Our God is a God of abundance. And in every scenario, there's always increase and more and more and more. And Bob Harrison said this to me in these CDs. I have spoken to him personally because he had me talk at one of his conventions once, which was really a privilege. But in these CDs, he said this, no one's, uh, uh, only two in a hundred will do what I tell them to do. But those two will have more success than the 98 put together. And I thought, you know what, I want that. (laughs) Um, And he said, look, you are driven by expectation. If you're expecting, um, for example, recession, what are you going to do? You're going to batten the hatches down. You're going to look at reducing people's time and and where can I cut my marketing? You're going to do all those types of things. So your actions and your behaviors flow (laughs) from your expectation. And that became very, very obvious to me. And when I do do a few business talks, I'll, I'll I'll say to people, who here is expecting to go on holiday this year? And you'll get a number of hands going up. And I said, I, I bet you or someone in your family will be on the internet. You'll be researching where to go. You'll be looking at the budgets. You'll be looking at the type of clothing you need to have, what visas you need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And I said, who here is going to go into space next year? Not a single hand went up. I said, okay, I bet not one of you is on the internet looking at the weightlessness effect uh, on your body. I bet one of you is not looking at spacesuits. So your expectations are there, um, but it's your actions and your behaviors that make your expectations happen. So if you're not expecting to do something, your, your actions and your behaviors won't flow. If you're not expecting to be successful, your actions and your behaviors are not there to make it happen. That makes pretty, pretty simple sense to me. But mm-hmm. to others, it doesn't make any sense at all. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, so I th- Bob went on to say, this is how you change your expectations. It's through what you see and what you hear. So... If you want to be a successful businessman, think of something that is obvious to your type of business and put posters on the walls. Look at them every day and confess things every day. So, okay, um, if I'm going to be national with my company, um, what, 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 what can I get? I'll go and get a big map of the UK, huge map. Um, At that point, I was working from the shed at the bottom of the garden. So I I put an A1 map on the four sides of of the internal bit of my shed. And I'm sitting there and I'd go in every day and I'd go, I'm going to be national. I'm going to be national. (laughs) And Bob said, you won't believe it at first. Um, But keep saying it. Keep saying it. And declare things over the chairs that people work in. So... uh, uh, and I and I learned that side of things uh, back in 1995. My wife and I went on a a, a course to become pa- pastors of a church, but we ended up not being pastors. Um, but a lot of declaration within that. So uh, yeah, that came very naturally to me. And he said, as long as you listen to great motivational things, and all I listened to for six months was his CDs, nothing else. And, uh, and I'm declaring. 
And he says, write down things you don't think are possible. And I think, well, a million pounds is not possible. So I'd, I'd write down on a post-it note, million pounds, million pounds. Every day I'd write it down and I'd declare over these posters, I'm going to be national. And he said, over, over a period of time, once your mindset starts to change, once you start to build an expectation, uh, your actions and your, your actions, your behaviors will start to change to make these things happen. So after six months, I'm beginning to think, well, if I'm going to be national, what do I need to, I need to be on a radio station, but I've got no money. Okay. I've got to be creative here. How do I get on a radio station when I've got no money? I've got these products that I print. So if I go to a local radio station and say, look, I'll give you the back page of this for free if you give me 500 pounds worth of radio. Oh, no, they'll not say yes to that. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I'll give it a go. So I phoned them up, went to go and see it, and they said yes. So now I've got a mini radio campaign and it hasn't cost me anything. So I thought, well, if that's worked in that area, I'm, I'm going to go to the next radio station and try it. And they said yes. So I went to the next radio station and they said yes. So it's that now I'm on three radio stations. But I'm thinking, well, that's just local. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna get on national national TV, I need to be on national TV. How can I possibly get on national TV? It's just phenomenal amount of money. So um at that point our membership was growing. And we worked out what it was going to cost to have our first TV campaign. And I actually called all the tradesmen that was on board. And this is so bizarre when I say this, because this does not happen in business. I said to, I said, I asked these trades, would you give a donation? <laughs> Who phones their customers and asks for a donation? But I did. And the vast majority of them said, yes, as long as you promise to use it to spend on marketing, we'll give you a donation. And that got me enough money to do my first campaign on TV. Um, and my mindsets changed at that point from believing that my God is going, Kev, you shouldn't be wealthy. You shouldn't have influence. You shouldn't have power. It's changed to... Go on, Kev, how far can you take this business? So now, instead of my God chastising me <laughs> on the sidelines, I've now got him saying, go on, Kev, you can do it. And that just, that, it's like all those magnets and all those ropes that were holding me back were all cut just through understanding the truth <laughs> of what the Bible says about success and how you should be with your money. Um, and from that point on, we just absolutely soared. Um, I'm, uh, my expectation of being national was just, it was there. And if there's any business people listening to this mm -hmm. and you were gleaning from this, that is, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's the number one thing from the CEO, from the boss is the expectation. Whatever your expectation is, that will be in your team. And from your top team, that will filter down into your, your, the, the people that are on the phones. And I, 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 I learned lots of things. Um, I learned that in the years where I was working for this, this gentleman I mentioned who gave me the advice to, uh, to, to give the business away, when I worked for him, he was a phenomenal employer. And I, and, I, and I learned several things from that. Uh, I learned the value of appreciation. Uh, simple little things like at Christmas, um, he would give us some cash. It wouldn't go straight into our bank account, it would be cash. And he would give us a turkey. <laughs> and without that cash in my hand, I'd never have been able to have bought my family Christmas presents because it just would have gone into a bank which was in overdrawn. So, I, I, yeah, so it, it, it was a bit strange as well, because when I looked at that boss at the time, I was really struggling. And I used to think to myself, I'm treading water and I'm, build, I'm building your dream, Mr. Tyler. I'm not building my dream. I'm building your dream. 
But that that wasn't a negative vibe. That was just my reality seeing it. And I worked hard for him. And I'm, I'd like to think that he would look back and go, Kev worked hard for me. Um, but I never, I never forgot that. So, so when, in, when anybody came to work for me, this is, this is what we used to do for appreciation. We would, we would get them to spend two weeks in every other department of the company. Um, so they knew where they were in the flow of all the work. And, um, and after two weeks, they would come and spend an hour and a half with me. And I would talk to them about the vision for the company and where the company's going. And we're doubling every 12 months. And, and in 12 months time, if you're still here, you could well be a team leader. And this is, this is where we're going to be in five years. And, uh, but, but I'd look at them in their eyes and I'd say, thank you for giving me a slice of your life. And the amount of ladies that would cry from that, it was, it, it was a lot. One or two guys cried as well. Mm. Thank you for giving me the price mm -hmm. of your life. Um, you could have picked anywhere to work, but you've chosen to you've chosen to work for me. And I know you're probably struggling, and you're building my dream. But you know, if you help build my dream, if you ever get to a point in your life where you want to build your own dream, come and see me, and I'll help you. Oh man, that meant so much to people, mm. so much. The culture of my company was was immense. It was immense, but there was there was other elements. I I, I learned that there are various things that people need in their life in order to function properly. There's appreciation, which I've spoken about. Um, there's integrity, and quite often in the sales environment, your integrity is flown out the window. But I, I would say to people that came to work for me, look, I know you're in sales, but if I catch you exaggerating, if I catch you as a lady trying to chat up, chat up a tradesman to get a sale, um, that's not going to go down too well. We tell them the truth. And if our company can't survive and, and flourish on the truth, then we shouldn't be in business. And that just really gave people that level of integrity that they'd never really experienced before working in a company. Um, and, and, and I learned that's one of the big things mm -hmm. that people need in their life. Another one would be being um, understood. Um, quite often, people are not understood in, in life. And when you've got two people that are having an argument of some, of, of, of some dispute, um, one person just wants to get their point across and not listen to the other person and it's vice versa. But I, 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 I learned that if we've got a, a consumer that's phoned up with a complaint or a tradesman that's phoned up with a complaint, I taught, I taught my people that uh, listen to what they are saying to you. You might have a tradesman that is really angry and is saying things that just didn't happen. Uh, but you've got to listen to what they what they say and just go, OK, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to listen to what you've got to say because I want to understand fully where you're coming from. And they would. And then what you've got to do is you've got to repeat back to that tradesman what you've heard, not your version, but what you've heard. And then what happens is, 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 oh, so you believe we did A, which resulted in this, and then we compound it by doing B, which resulted in something even worse. Is that correct? Yes. And you get a sigh. And it's like, they understand. <laughs> and once someone gets to that point, they're much, much more likely to listen to your side of the story. But this is what I say to my, my employees. If you think after listening to what's gone on, you put your feet in their shoes. And if you think they deserve all their money back, I'm empowering you to do it without asking a manager. Just do it. If you think they deserve their money back for a month and a free month's membership, just do it. Do what you feel you would want to happen to you if you were in their shoes. And that's how I that's how I empowered my team. Um, trust is another another big one in people's lives. 
Um, I always used to struggle with mm-hmm. my management style because I'd just come to people and I'd ask them to do it and I'd just wander off thinking, well, they're going to do it now, surely. <laughs> And then I'd find out three weeks later they hadn't started because they needed more information and more this and more that. Anyway, one of one of the, another inspiration to mine is um, uh, uh, Covey Junior. I can't remember his first name now. You know the Seven Habits. Stephen Covey, his son Junior. Uh, Stephen Covey Junior. He had something called the Power of Trust or the Speed of Trust. And that really did speak to me very, very quickly. Um, he talked about if there's no trust, like, for example, 9-11's happened. Uh, before 9-11, you could arrive at an airport and get on a plane. Now you've got to go through security and now you've got to pay taxes. So the trust level has fallen. So it costs more and takes longer. So that's, that's one example of negative trust. Uh, and then he gave an example of this guy that works in a burger, a burger uh, van. And he's thinking, how can I improve my service? Because I'm noticing that if my queue is more than two or three people, people are just wandering off and going somewhere else. I need to serve my customers quicker. So he rearranged things, his cooking order and everything else. But what he did was he got a goldfish bowl, filled it full of change, and put it outside on a table. So when people gave him $5, he'd say, help yourself to the change, next. And that speeded things up. So he was really trusting people Mm -hmm. to take the right amount of money. But now the results were, people weren't bothering to take their change and they were leaving it as a tip. Where we'd never get tips before. So his trust levels (laughs) went up, his speed went up and his income went up. So after listening to that, I I thought, that's my management style. It's trust. Great. (laughs) I did tweak it a bit, though. But so often in businesses, the bosses would go into a department and say, right, I've made some changes. Do this, do this, do that, do that, do the other. And everyone sitting there would go, are you not even going to ask my opinion? So this is what what Mm -hmm. I would do. I'd, I'd, I'd go into my complaints department, for example, and, uh, and I'd, I'd say to the lady in charge, um, you've been in this job now three years. You must have things going through your head where you think that's not necessary. We shouldn't be doing this. But if we did this and this, it would make a huge difference. Y- yeah, of course, Kev. OK, what I'd like you to do is take the next two weeks. You can involve your whole team if you want or you can bring selected people, however you want to do it. Um, you can do it in work time, but in two weeks, I'd really like a presentation from you. I've got it in my head what I think it should be. And then, so now they're working on it and they're thinking about it. Uh, and now they've come back to me and they've presented. And quite often it's so much better than, than what I had in my own, my own head. Sometimes we had to tweak it. I'd say, well, Mm -hmm. knowing that department over there a little bit better, go and speak to John in sales because I think that could have a slight impact on what he's doing. Go go back to him, mind that bit out, and then and then yeah, implement it. But if 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 you give them if if you give them responsibility, um, they will want to be involved, and if they've got that involvement, they'll deliver it. They'll deliver it, and that's what I found. So those things were, were, were massive. And then on top of all that, there was the vision that I've already mentioned. I'd really plow into my top team around me, the vision of the mm-hmm. company. And that expectation was there. And that would just flow into everybody else into the company to a point where um, if, so, if one of my sales ladies was on, on the phone talking to a tradesman and that tradesman says, no, it's not for me, they'd go, sorry. What what would be your reason for not wanting to be part of this? It's just phenomenal. Everybody that joins it, their business doubles in 12 months. Why, why would you not want that? Um, and we ended up with no external sales at all. No cold calling at all. None. We just had thousands of trades contacting us. I had an inbound sales team. Thousands of trades calling every month. Tell me about Checker Trade. My mate's getting so much work from it. It, it was phenomenal. It was. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, but I sold it, and I wish I hadn't. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the story <laughs> from that. I, I mean, we end we ended up. I have printed something else out because um, I'm just going to read it. We ended up in the UK. Bearing in mind the UK is quite small compared to the United States, um, but we were generating 3.5 billion for 29,000 trades. We were we were getting over one and a half million people on our <laughs> website every month. Um, the first people in the world to do online online reviews. Uh, we had 320 uh, employees across eight departments across two offices in the UK. Um, uh, but probably, I mean, there's heaps of other stuff. But probably one of the things that was my biggest success is that my team would work, walk on hot coals for me. That's my biggest success. Mm. My team would do anything for me. And that's because mm -hmm. they knew mm -hmm. I would do anything for them. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was so exciting, so uh, so invigorating. Um, and the, the, the journey, which lasted 19 years, and then I sold the company, uh, was, was immense. But uh, the sale of the company has opened up so many more avenues for me. Um, I never expected to sell the company for a lot of money, but I did. Um, it wasn't a plan to do that. My plan was to solve the the rogue trade problem in the UK. That was my that was my ambition, and to a big extent, you, you know, it's gone so much further than that because every every marketplace across the whole world now has an element of dependency upon reviews. Um, which wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Well, it probably still would have happened, but I just happened to be the first to do it. Yeah, and that got us the Queen's Award, which was really quite mm -hmm. special. We got to meet, I got to meet the Queen before she... No, oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was a bizarre, that was a bizarre day at Buckingham Palace, but it was very enjoyable. Um, we didn't even know we were going to meet her. We were just asked to queue up along this wall in, inside Buckingham Palace. So we thought, oh, okay, obviously there's someone there that's going to shake our hands and and whatever. Anyway, when we got to the, the corner of the wall and we couldn't see what was around the other side, the gentleman said to me, now you have to refer to her as your majesty. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> She's around the corner? <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, we got to meet the, the Queen and Prince Philip um, and it was a, f a phenomenal day. That was phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, it's good. Oh yeah! Wow. Hmm. That's success. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because most people, when they talk about success, they just put a monetary value to it. And uh, I've, 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 as I said earlier, I, I, I do regret selling it. It's a bit bittersweet because selling it, uh, I sold my baby and it left me in quite a dark place for many years. Mm -hmm. um, but it's opened up mm -hmm. avenues to do other things overseas with charitable work that I would never have ever been able to have done. Um, yeah. Fortunately, I was able to find someone that really wanted the company um, and he paid a lot of money for it, um, more than it was worth for sure. Yeah, it was worth a lot, but he paid more than what it was worth because it, it, it fitted in with his business plans. Uh, so a national company in the UK bought mm -hmm. off me. But um, during all that time, I created something called the Checker Trade Foundation. And uh, that that started probably about 10 years ago. So this is about six years before I sold my company. Uh, Church Connections, I uh, visited Nepal mm -hmm. with, uh, with one of my daughters, Anna. And um, we visited Nepal and we went to various churches and we saw various... Um, uh, pastors out there and quite often what happens is these pastors don't have any money but they end up with a small extended family within their church there might have been a, a, a an orphan child so they'll take the child on 
uh, or, or they'll hear of a really bad case and they'll end up with two or three of their own children, but four or five other children as well adopted into the family. And mm -hmm. we went to see this particular pastor called Raju. And Raju was uh, a caste called the Bardi people. So uh, I, I'm sure most people listening to this will understand in that part of the world, there is a, a, a caste system. And right at the bottom of the caste system are the untouchables. And depending on what country you're in, depends on how many castes there are. Uh, in some countries, there's as many as 20. Uh, in other countries like Bangladesh, there might only be three. Uh, and then that would again depend on whether you're a Muslim or a Hindu. Uh, Hindus tend to have a few more than Muslims, for example. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, we this particular pastor had about 15 to 20 girls extended in his family. And he had a little bit of support from overseas. Um, but he got these girls to, to do a dance for us. Really, really sweet girls. Anything from six to to 16, that kind of age group. And very, very mm -hmm. talented dancers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we clapped at the end. And then Raju said, uh, Smirti, come over and, and tell Kevin and Anna your story. So I thought, okay. Pretty oblivious to the situations over there. And she proceeded to tell this story. And I said, do you mind if I video it? And I've actually got this on YouTube. Um, Smirti, mm -hmm. Uh, explained how the, at the age of about eight, her parents sold her into the sex trade. And straight away, you just go, mm. when you hear that for the first time, your parents sold you into the sex trade? That just seems, no, that can't be right. I wonder that's been mistranslated. Um, but no, her parents sold her into the sex trade. And she ended up in a brothel in a place called Saket, which is about 400 kilometers away from Kathmandu. And uh, she was there. Uh, uh, she's being abused 30, 40 times a day. Uh, subsequently, I'm adding, to this, I'm adding to this story now because there are so many stories. Girls, if they don't behave, they'll have cigarettes put out on them they'll be put into, into baths and have electric shocks. Um, the brothels are normally mm -hmm. one door in and all the windows are barred, so they can't escape. Um, and it, it, it must be, uh, it must be hell. I, I, you can't really ex think of any other mm -hmm. thing. Exactly. It must be hell. And these, guys, these girls are as, long as, mm -hmm. as young as eight years old. Some of them are younger. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, somehow she manages to escape from this brothel, somehow. And she uh, manages to get to India because she thought that would be a good place to get to. So she, she thumbs a ride all the way from, I don't think it must be about a thousand kilometers. She gets to India, she meets this young guy who marries her, who sells her straight back into the sex trade. Anyway. A few more years go by and she manages to escape again and she thought she'll get back to Kathmandu. And um, she hears that in Kathmandu, there's this guy called Raju that looks after Bardi girls. And my memory is a little bit sketchy. I'll have to go back and, <laughs> and watch the video again. But somehow she manages to hook back up with, with Raju. Uh, and now she says on this video, I can sleep at night because men don't touch me. And she's about 16 at that point. Mm -hmm. And I wow. go, wow. And then she says, one day I hope to have my children back. You've got children? Um, anyway, we came back from Kathmandu and I thought I'd show that video to my, to my team at Checker Trade. There's probably about 50 or 60 people at that point working for me. And I showed the video. And that afternoon, about five came and knocked on my door. Kevin, can I have a word? He says, yeah, of course you can. That lady, uh, Smirti, how can we get her kids back? Wow. I, I, I don't know. 
And I had five people, about five, come and knock on my door and said all the same thing. So I, I got in touch with Raju and he said, well, they'll, they'll, they're still in the original brothel down in Saket, 400 kilometers away. He says, we've got two options. Uh, I can go and knock on their door and buy them. And they're boys, two boys. Boys are valuable because a boy will stay with you all your life. Girls are not valuable because they will marry another boy and go and be the pension for another mum and dad somewhere else. That's why girls have got no value. So boys are valuable. They'll cost about $350 a piece. I said, okay, he said, but it's more than that, Kev. If I take two more children on board, who feeds them? Who educates them? How do I get them de and, mm -hmm. and medicated? I said, okay, what's that going to cost? He says, it's going to cost about $80, $80 a month to keep each child. So I said, okay. So I went back to my team and I said, look, we need to find two lots of $350 plus whatever the traveling expenses are because it's 400 kilometers. And then what we need to do is we need to pledge mm -hmm. a monthly amount until these girls, until these boys are grown up. And it was absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal. I think there was about 4,000 pounds given there and then. And there was commitment for about four or five children on a monthly basis. And that was like, wow, that's just incredible. And that was the start of the Checker Trade Foundation. And to cut a long story short on that one, uh, she got her two boys back. Those boys now, um, mm. they both speak fluent English. They're both probably round about 16, 17, I'd guess now. Uh, one wants to be a doctor and one wants to be a pastor. I mean, that is a phenomenal story for one girl who managed to, to get the, her life back and her children back. Phenomenal story. And we've had many, mm -hmm. many stories like that yeah. now. Mm. So... Um, mm. Praise the Lord. Huh? It, was, it was incredible. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. So with that, the start of the Checker Trade Foundation, we started to do all sorts of different things. I, I went through a, a bit of a midlife crisis once I hit 50 and decided that I needed to run a marathon, which I did. I was 21 stone mm -hmm. at the time, very heavy, um, and lost a lot of weight, got down mm -hmm. to 16 and, and run the London Marathon. Then I did one for charity. Then I did 12 marathons in 12 months. Uh, and, and we waited. Oh, wow. Yeah, must be mad. <laughs> Um, after that, I was uh, a monster. <laughs> You're a monster, and men need to be monsters so that we can <laughs> get where we need to go in our lives and have the it's, the help of our men. That's what we need. It's not often I'm called a monster, <laughs> but there you go. Thank you. I know. I take it as a compliment. My husband does that. My husband, you take it as a compliment. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. But when we <laughs> when we sold the company. Uh, what was happening within the Checker Trade Foundation was very personal to me and not necessarily to the new buyers of the company. And they said, look, uh, I think you should just take it over, Kev. Um, so we had to come up with a name pretty quickly. And as a, for, for tax reasons, what I did was I gifted 8% of the, the company's shares to this, to the foundation, to the charity. So I was, um, I was able to get a reasonable amount of money out of the pot um, into a charity without paying tax. So uh, we had to come up with a name pretty quick. So we just called it the Byrne Family Foundation. And I'm still not sure whether that's a good name or not. Don't know. <laughs> um, I feel a little bit uh, uneasy having it called my surname. Um, yeah, the, the jury's still out on that one. But we've, we've done some phenomenal things. Um, we, um, we finance four schools in Bangladesh. And that journey is on its own in incredibly special. Um, my senior pastor came to me and he says, Kev, I've got this. How many, how many kids can be educated in those schools? There's 650 at the moment. 
But my, my, yeah. my pastor came to me and said, Kev, um, I've got this contact in Bangladesh where they've just lost their financial support for their schools. Would you be prepared to take it over? Yeah, okay, we'll do it. So we took, after, we, we, we took hold of the financial responsibilities. But after about a year, we thought we better go out there and make sure these schools exist. So that was our, that was our first trip to Bangladesh. <laughs> And we went to visit, I think we visited three of the four schools in the time that we had. And it, it was just incredible. I had no idea. These were children, anything from the age of four to 16, all Muslim children, Muslim or Hindu, majority Muslim, whose, uh, whose family had never had any education before. So they were the first ever in their family line to ever mm -hmm. receive any form of education. And the first thing we noticed when we got there to the first school is not only are all these children lined up um, and, and they want to put a garland around you and they're all singing, welcome, welcome. Next to the school is a, is a, um, a lake. And there was about 20 people being baptized. I thought, that's really odd. So I said, Christopher, what, I know what's going on. They're baptizing, but it just seems a bit odd. Yes, yes, these are all relatives of the children that have given their lives to Christ. What? <laughs> and that was, uh, wow. I said, well, how, how many people have given their lives to Christ as a result of the school? Oh, thousands. What? That was a big shock to me, and, it, and, and it, it, it wasn't what we ever anticipated or believed or never even crossed our minds that anything like that could happen. Mm -hmm. But I'm paraphrasing this now, but what was happening is these kids are going home and their families are going, Muhammad's never done anything for me, Allah's never done anything for me, but these Christians are educating our children for free. So, and they're learning the word of God in the school and taking it back to their families. And it's just been an incredible journey. So we've, we've been out twice to see the schools now. We recently came back from Bangladesh um, about 10 days ago. And uh, again, we visited mm -hmm. some of these schools mm -hmm. and they are just so, so full of love, so full of appreciation. Um, and joy like you wouldn't believe you are just treated like an absolute king and queen when you're there uh and it is so humbling um yeah it's it's had a huge impact on my life that has so there's four schools 16 teachers um uh, but but it's really basic stuff really basic you know they've got premises it's a it's like a tin hut tin huts um Going out there again just recently, you know, I've made a pledge with Christopher to give him some more money to, for more more uh, learning materials, books and pens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's, there's no computers. Um, often there's no light <laughs> because the this is not this is not in mm -hmm. a central mm -hmm. city. This is right out in the sticks in the countryside. Um, but uh, our, our aim at that point was how, how can we open more schools? Because education is the way mm -hmm. out of poverty, of course. Um, and it's, it's changing the whole right. village. It's changing that whole future of that whole family, uh, particularly if they're boys, because they'll mm -hmm. go and get a job. If you can speak English, you'll get a job. Yeah. So... We wanted to... Mm -hmm. Oh, so they're learning English in the schools. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's very important. That's yeah. one of the biggest things mm -hmm. that they need to know, apart from the Word of God, of course, and mm -hmm. some of the basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but from that, it's Bangladesh contact has developed quite quite dramatically. Um, we, went, we went to see uh, Christopher's uh, hostels. He had a he had a hostel for for girls and a hostel for boys. And that particular trip, we visited the hostel for the girls, and um, they were in temporary accommodation. 
because they had a property that had been condemned. I don't know whether you recall a, a textile company that the whole building fell down in Bangladesh about eight years ago. And it was very embarrassing for the Bangladesh mm -hmm. government. And they they put, set a program to to look at all buildings that housed more than X amount of people. Uh, and they condemned the, 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 the hostel for girls. And uh, they couldn't live there anymore because of it. And Ashley said, Kev, is there anything you can do? So um, we came back home, spoke to Rachel, my other, my other daughters and my wife. And um, we decided to, to, to build them a hostel. Not only did we decide to build them a hostel, we decided to build a hostel that was big enough to, to have teacher training there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we put a lot of money into that. I think it cost us £750,000. What's that, about a million dollars to build that? Um, <laughs> but uh, it opened 18 mm -hmm. months ago during lockdown. And that was really tough for us because we mm -hmm. really wanted to get out there, but we couldn't. But uh, it was finished, so they had their own opening, uh, which they were they managed to get it zoomed to us, so we could at least watch it via the internet. Um, but when they when they opened mm -hmm. the hostel for the girls, the boys were there to celebrate with them, and we knew what the boys lived in. They lived in atrocious accommodation basically a big tin hut that was freezing in the winter and an oven in the summer and inside the building mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you could see the watermark <laughs> which was above the bottom bunk so mm -hmm. when the floods came in the rain season the boys in the bottom bunk had to get into the top bunk yeah. And, and it was like, and now here are these boys visiting the opening of the girls' hostel. And it's a phenomenal building. In, in southern Bangladesh, it's one of the best buildings that's been built in the last 10 years. And it's finished. They don't finish mm -hmm. buildings in Bangladesh. Um, and, and that's had an, uh, an, an incredible impact on Christopher's reputation over there and his status, which, is, which has worked for him very well as a Christian mm -hmm. in a Muslim country. Um, but these boys must have had in, in, incredibly mixed feelings on how happy they were for the girls. But look what we've got to go back to, guys. And I just turned to my family and I said, we've got to do something. You know, we've, I, I, really, I really understand the principles of your environment and what it does for you. If you if if you're brought up in a slum, the chances are you'll stay in a slum with a slum mentality. But if 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 you can change that and put some quality stuff around you, and put some great teachings around you as well, that's just going to change your whole outlook on what you can achieve. Um, and that's probably the, the, one of the greatest thrills we've ever had. We went over, as I said, 10 days ago to open the boys' hostel as well as visiting some of the schools. So we opened the mm -hmm. boys' hostel. And again, um, the love, the appreciation um, and the treatment that you get is... And it's, it's, hard, it's hard to get your head around it because these are the untouchables. These are the people where they have to fight incredibly hard just, just for their government to recognize them, to give them a, a passport. These are the people that if they go to the next village, they'll be spat upon. Um, and yet now they're having a white person not only, not only uh, coming into their life, but these white people will hug you to us. That just seems bizarre mm. to them. It's to them. It's off the scale to us. It's in a, it's, it's in a bizarre sense mm -hmm. that why should that be so strange? But to them, their own fellow people will spit on them. They can't get a job. Um, they can't get food. They would be the last people in the queue that someone would even sell food to. Um, 
So for us to go into their house and sit on their bed, uh, for them, it's it's something that is just not possible. It just would never happen. Uh, so their appreciation and their love and, and the way they just hug you. But we, we also had um, another opening for the girls one, even though it was opened 18 months ago. Um, they, they put a ribbon across uh, and we cut the ribbon and went in and... Um, if anybody ever wants to watch any of those videos, if you if you search for the Byrne Family Foundation on Facebook, you'll find us and those videos are there. They're incredibly special. And Byrne, by the way, is spelt the Irish way. It's B-Y-R-N-E. So Byrne Family Foundation on Facebook, you'll, you'll see the videos. They are incredibly special. Um, and it's it's probably the biggest focus in my life because I've come back and I'm thinking, how how can I do more? What else can I do to mm -hmm. to uh, improve these people's lives or to or to double the amount of people because there's enough room to double the amount of boys and girls that are in these hostels. But you you take another mm -hmm. another child on, you've got to feed them, educate them, delice them, counsel them, love them clothe them um, there's a cost to all of that mm -hmm. mm. but at the moment I think there's 48 girls that we completely yeah. finance and I think there's 36 boys that we completely finance yeah but it's a big joy in my life yeah mm -hmm. I don't, I don't yeah, I think it's... love love and attention are the same thing yes yeah yeah hope faith and yeah. love the greatest I think that love. people don't realize that attention, kids will do anything for attention, right? Because attention and love are the same thing. Yes. Mm. They'll do anything for love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we all like love, don't we? <laughs> That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my, my husband, uh, he's a psychologist. And the virtues that you were talking about, honesty, trust, understanding, all these things. He talks about those things in his lectures. And you have such a wonderful story because people love stories. And if we don't hear these virtues put within a story, we can't understand them. And so you've given us a story that my listeners can understand. And thank you so much for that. No, it's, it's been my pleasure, Tammy. I've been looking forward to that since yeah. since uh, Rachel had her time with you, uh, and she of course enjoyed that immensely. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, yeah. I think she felt she was a little bit out of her depth. That's I don't remember now who put me in touch with Rachel, but someone put me in touch with Rachel. I can't remember who it was, but I can, I'm thankful to whoever that was. <laughs> Maybe I'll find out again. Maybe. But I think, you know, I've been trying to speak to people about the divine feminine and there's, there's light in that story, but there's also deep darkness in that story. And we have to know about it all. Absolutely. And so I appreciate your, uh, your journey to find vision, that vision, man, you can't get anywhere without vision. No, I, I agree. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. Do, well, that's what you told us. When I do, that's great. When I do business talks, most people will say, well, Kev, what, what is the number one thing? And, and I said, the Holy Spirit can't give you something you're not expecting to get. And it's true. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a secular uh, business talk, I'll say you'll, you'll, you'll never achieve something you don't believe you can achieve. You've got to have the expectation. Yeah. Without that, you're just floundering. Yeah. My my husband has a program, online program called selfauthoring.com. And he's done some research in different universities giving this exercise in future authoring. What would your life be like three to five years down the road if you could be Anything. The best person you could be for yourself. Yeah. Who would that be? Yeah. And then you write for 15 minutes with no editing, just dreaming, just dreaming who that might be. And then another vision of 
Who would you be if all the bad habits in your life had control? Who would you be in five years oh. so that you have something to to run away from and something to to run towards? Yeah. And uh, for boys. So he did this research once in Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands in the business school. And there were uh, Dutch women, Dutch men, immigrant women and immigrant men and the Dutch women had the highest grades and the immigrant men had the lowest grades and after they did the future authoring program the men and it only takes about 90 minutes or you can take three or four hours it depends on what you do but you can do it in 90 minutes and those kids there they uh, drop the dropout rate from school by 50 percent yeah and the men, the immigrant men, in the next year were doing as well as the Dutch women. Wow. Because they had to find their own motivation to be there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, and no universe, all of this research and no universities in North America or Europe are using the program. He sold it uh, privately, but the education system is what it is. And, and, yeah. They don't necessarily, they don't realize that it's vision. Yeah. It's vision. And if you don't have, if you're not aiming at anything, you're not going to hit the mark. You're dead right. Yeah. And I, I, have, I yeah. have the joy. Uh, I don't do it as much as I'd like. It probably only happens two or three times a year. But occasionally I'll get invited to go into a college or a university um, and to give my story about where I've come from uh, and try and relay that to everybody. Oh yeah. Saying it's not, you know, if you want to. That's a great story. If you want to be a lawyer, or if you want to be a doctor, obviously you need an education, but you don't have to have an education to be successful. Um, right. That, right. That's always received incredibly well because so many, so many of these teenagers, they they just look at the the people that are in their class and just think, well, they're just so much better than I am it's but it's mm -hmm. it's not true it, it's it's not down to uh just your education uh i'm not academic at all i had a very very poor because i was brought up in the forces i just went from country to country to country to school to school to school and i got to a point where there was just no point so i i, I left school at 16 with nothing uh no qualifications at all mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you must have had you had a you had a good beginning with your family, I think. Oh, certainly with my mum. Yeah, yeah. I've got some very fond memories of my mum. Uh, but my my dad, sadly, when I was ten, um, he had a, a bad experience with a, an operation, and the anaesthetist was negligent and put him into a coma for ten days. But when he came round, oh dear. Coma, He'd lost twenty years of his memory, so I I, I lost my Ooh. I lost my dad when I was ten. He finally died mm -hmm. when I was twenty, but he didn't know who I was. Oh gee, where's he? Mm. Yeah, well that's yeah that that's very difficult. Yeah. Um, but when you did know him from from the time you were a little guy, yeah. did he spend time with you? Um. I don't have much memory of that. I can remember, mm -hmm. I can remember, uh, in particular, uh, we lived in Cyprus for a number of years. So I can, I can rem this is before, uh, uh, the split in Cyprus happened with the Turks and the Greek. Mm -hmm. And I can remember we used to, we used to do, uh, um, caravanning to some of the really nice beaches on North Cyprus and, I could, I've got fond memories of that, but my, my dad did work an awful lot. His, his job was to implement um, security systems in guard rooms uh, in, into military bases. Mm. So he used to disappear for a month at a time. So there was a, most of my childhood memories are just my mum and me, my mum and I. Right. But, well, you know, we're finding that now through the research, 
maybe you know this research, but uh, kids who are raised without a father, because you weren't really raised without a father. You had a father. You knew who he was. You believed in him. Uh, I had a father. He was always working. He he wasn't around much either, but I had. he was there, and he stayed married to my mom. Um, but people who were raised without a father, they... Uh, the telomeres on their DNA is shorter for boys, huh? shorter enough that it shortens your life if you don't have a father. Wow. It's the same for girls, but it's more uh, profound for boys. Okay. So families are very important. Mums and dads are important. Indeed. And uh, especially, and, and I don't know, you know, when you, if you have a, uh, if you're raised in a hostel and you don't have parents. Um, I haven't seen the research of the caretakers that are in those places. I imagine they, you know, you only need one real uh, Figurehead. person that you can depend on and look up to. Yeah. And that's something for people to know too. If they have one person yes. that they can depend upon. Yeah. They can, they can look to that person. And then of course there's your relationship as a Christian, which is huge because our relationship with, with God is so necessary to give us strength and courage. So, yeah, well, I really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you very much. Um, I should let you go because I've had you here for an hour and a half and that's usually about as long as I <laughs> have conversations. No, that's great. Tammy, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.